kind, caring, and vivacious. Aaron Chorney was a bright light in the community of Brandon, Manitoba. Aaron loves to get out and have a good time, until one day, she doesn't come home. The tight-knit local community rally, but searches and pleas go nowhere, and there aren't any leads, until one day, anonymous letters start to appear. All of the letters alluded to the writer either being responsible for Aaron's disappearance or for having intimate knowledge of what actually happened. Police intensify their search and leave no stone unturned. We actually went in and did a surreptitious search of that grave to determine if Aaron's body was likely in there. Eventually, detectives decide to take it to another level. There are investigators who do become very proficient at conducting undercover operations where they can fully immerse themselves in a criminal underworld, so to speak. Sometimes to catch a criminal, you have to think like a criminal. As one travels north on Manitoba Highway 10, three hours north of Minot, North Dakota, they come across Brandon, Manitoba, Canada. Population, 48,859. Its surrounding agriculture sprawls out across the countryside, making Brandon the commercial hub of southwestern Manitoba. One might stop by the Comfort Kitchen Cafe for a delicious breakfast, or hit up the local downtown shops. Known for its winning hockey teams, provincial exhibition, and being a quiet place perfect for raising a family, on April 21, 2002, the vibrancy of the community dims. Darcy and Debbie Chorney are the proud parents of three children. Aaron was born September 30, 1983. Aaron was a great child. When she was growing up, we spent a lot of time together. We uh, did a lot of activities together. She was into sports. Beautiful blonde hair, always loved to play and um, all the games that toddlers play, um, always followed us around, loved to read books, loved to be read to. She would often um, want to write stories as she was growing up, um, writing and reading, and she, her dream was to be um, a writer, um, write a book someday. Loved to participate in family events. Um, she was very much the eldest of the cousins, so always the imagination, Erin's imagination was uh, the most amazing part because she was able to include the greater of the family. We have a very, very large family, many nieces and nephews on my side of the family on both sides. So always participated, brought in the little ones, brought in the bigger ones, um, often at church events or uh, family functions and whatnot. She'd always have somebody doing a play or singing songs and so forth. So she was just always a joy to be around. We had lots of picnics in the backyard. Um, she would make snow forts with me. She was like the older sister that everybody would have wanted because she just was like there and cared so much about us and the family, and she was athletic, she loves sports, and is the best person I know. But she always involved me, like her friends always um, would let me put their makeup on or whatever, and we would go, like she went, she took me trick-or-treating, she would help me get ready for school in the morning, every morning. I spent more time with her than 
the rest of my family growing up. She was my best friend. And um, she was so funny. Like many couples with children, Debbie and Darcy drift apart amidst raising a family and trying to make a go of it and decide to get separated. The separation is hard on Erin, who loves family more than anything. She, like most youth, has her moments of acting out. But that never stops Erin from being an important part of their large extended family. Living with me was just a, a, a release for her, to have an opportunity to have a change of pace. Moving away from Brandon, um, having new friends, um, really having an opportunity to maybe find her place in um, a school setting. But in the end, it wasn't something that um, was working well for Erin. I wanted her to stay with us, but she just needed to move back home. Erin has a big personality. While parents know that can be challenging at times, she's loved by them and her large group of friends. She had like a social life, so she did hang out with her friends quite often. A 19-year-old prairie girl, Erin loves a good party. She was born to be the star of the show. Always the center of attention, she loves to entertain and have a great time. She had many friends, but she was just always a joy to be around. Erin dates 21-year-old Michael Bridges. Her parents don't warm up to him as he is standoffish. He was not uh, a part of the family functions, never participated in anything. And Erin would, you know, look to um, look for that comfort from him, I guess, but um, never really panned out for her. Aaron spends a lot of time with Michael over the course of their short relationship, but things don't work out and they break up. The breakup is hard on Aaron. She finds herself going down a bad path, one her family is confident she'll put behind her. Debbie Chorney is happy to have a girl's day with Aaron and Leslie. Aaron and her brother live with their father at the family home, but Debbie moves into an apartment during their separation. Well, she was spending time between my place and her mother's place. We were separated. And uh, she would be about half time at, between each. And... and between them, Erin maintains her busy social life. Erin spends the day with her mom and sister. They put together an old fashioned family meal, something they haven't done for a while since the separation. Erin receives a phone call and tells her mom she'll be back in an hour after she has coffee with some friends. She can't get away without a hug from her younger sister, Leslie, who looks up to Erin. I think the age gap helped just in terms of like, I, I think Erin was able to talk to me without having um, like a filter on. Because I was so young, she was able to talk to me a lot more comfortably than she would the rest of the family, maybe. Aaron leaves with her ex-boyfriend, Michael Bridges, and his friend, Bount Heavy Segmani. After they drive around for a bit, it becomes clear that Bount Heavy is the third wheel, and he gets dropped off at home. According to Michael, Aaron and he spend an enjoyable evening together. She cuts his hair and gives him some relationship advice. Despite being broken up, they're determined to remain friends. At 11.30 p.m., Aaron heads out to meet some other friends and party. Back at home, Debbie is wondering what happened to Aaron. She was supposed to be home hours ago, and it's getting late. Debbie knows her daughter. She's probably out with friends, so there's no sense waiting up for her. But something just doesn't feel right. The second largest city in the province of Manitoba, Brandon serves a large agricultural region of southwestern Manitoba known as West Van. In 2002, the city was known as one of the 10 best cities in Canada. Always had the kids out all 
um, playing or running the fields at Brandon Hills and um, playing hide and seek, whatever it would be. So Brandon was a great um, place to raise a family. Many enjoy the good life out here in what is lovingly known as the biggest small town you'll ever visit. But someone sinister is lurking. Someone who will change the way Brandon sees itself forever. It's Monday morning, April 22nd, 2002. Debbie Chorney wakes up and checks Aaron's room. She's still not home. While Debbie isn't surprised, Aaron's done this before. She's concerned that Aaron doesn't have her things. She chalks it up to Aaron's unpredictable way and carries on with her day. It's been a few days since Debbie last saw Aaron, and she is understandably concerned. Debbie contacted me on a Wednesday following the weekend that she was at her place and said that Aaron hadn't returned home and wanted to know if I had heard from her, and I said no. Could that be it? Is Aaron just out with friends? Well, we were hoping that she had just you know, gone off on a tangent and took off somewhere and she would contact us sooner or later. Aaron's been away before, but she always calls to let her family know she's safe. When Debbie and Darcy see that Aaron hasn't taken her medication with her, their concern is heightened. I remember sitting on the couch and I was watching TV one night. My mom was calling every single person that she could think of. And she was like, she had the um, phone book and was crossing off like names and writing down every single name. And it was just like um, hearing the phone hang up and then be picked up again. And the same, like if you've heard or seen, Aaron, please let us know because we don't know where she is. With no luck contacting friends and family, it's time to call the police. Sergeant Dallas Lockhart is assigned to be the lead investigator after police hear about Aaron's disappearance. As he takes down his notes, he knows he'll have his work cut out for him. Her mom, Debbie, came to the police uh, station in person and filed, in essence, a missing person report saying that her daughter, Erin, hadn't been heard from for several days. Um, this was a typical behavior, uh, but not out of the realm of possibility that Erin was just off partying somewhere. The member who was assigned to it at that time did the preliminary uh, inquiries, doing the obvious things, checking to see if there was any interaction with police through our records management system, checking the hospitals and other avenues where somebody may go Police contact Michael Bridges, Aaron's ex-boyfriend, to see if he has any idea where she might be. Police are shocked to learn that Michael is with Aaron the day she disappeared. Michael describes his evening as a pleasant one. She cuts his hair, they hang out for a bit, share some laughs, and she leaves around 11.30 p.m. that night, concluding that Aaron was a good chick. Was? The police are suspicious. They know that all is not as it appears when it comes to Aaron and Michael's relationship. Her and Michael met each other and it was always tumultuous. The whole relationship was tumultuous. I remember the Easter of 2002, we drove, our whole entire family drove out to um, Saskatoon to visit some family members. Erin drove in the car with me that time, and she did share with me that she was going through some very, very difficult times with uh, her then ex-boyfriend. Um, there's some assault charges against him. It seems Erin and Michael were constantly fighting due to Michael's jealousy. He destroys Erin's belongings and likes to embarrass her in front of others. On March 10th, 2002, Aaron and friends head over to Michael's in the wee hours of the morning. A drunk Michael gets into an argument with Aaron and he lashes out, choking her. Aaron's friend comes to her aid, breaking up the fight, but doesn't come out unscathed. Michael attacks her, throwing her across the room and punching her. It takes Michael's mother, George Ann Bridges, who Michael lives with, to finally resolve the conflict, managing to get the girls away from Michael. Aaron presses charges against Michael in hopes of sending him a message that his behavior is unacceptable. 
Well, when I first looked at the file, the, the obvious thing that jumped out at me was her relationship with Michael Bridges. Uh, the fact that he was actually under charge for assaulting her and a friend. When questioned about the charges, Michael is apologetic but cold. He pleads guilty to the charges to get them behind him, two days after Aaron is last seen alive. Michael is confident, agreeing to take a lie detector test if necessary. The validity of a polygraph test result has long been debated both scientifically and in the criminal justice system. In fact, the United States Supreme Court and, and most courts in general don't accept the results of polygraph tests. They're considered to be somewhat unreliable. Suspicious or not, with no body or authority to keep Michael in custody, he's released. Police speak with Michael's friend, Balthavi Sigmani. He confirms that he saw Aaron on April 21st with Michael, but is dropped off shortly after they pick her up. Sigmani even volunteers to take a lie detection test to prove his innocence. Police continue their search for Aaron, but are running out of leads. No one knows where Aaron is, and Debbie and Darcy are at wit's end. They try to remain hopeful that they can find her. But as days turned into weeks, and weeks turned into months, you know, we realized that that wasn't the case. Darcy and Debbie Chorney are at wit's end. They plead with the community for any information they may have on Aaron's whereabouts. The overall community response to the Chorney's plight is heartening. Search parties were incredible. The community of Brandon was so incredible. Um, trying to help us find her. Um, friends across Canada were putting posters up, child find posters, um, trying to figure out where she was. I remember like them searching for Aaron and uh, my mom and dad, I know, benefited from having a uh, child find, like walk them through and help them know what to do or um, like press wise, it sucks to have to be like in the spotlight all the time. My school actually was amazing. They were super and um, they protected me from a lot of like people talking about it. Every tip that came in to the best of our ability to basically put it to rest. And that included everything from, you know, reported sightings in Vancouver to she was working as a squeegee kid in Winnipeg to that she went into a rehab center of her own volition. As we progress through it, um, Mike Bridges goes from becoming really a witness to a person of interest to a suspect. Police bring him in for questioning again, but this time he refuses to take the polygraph test he had agreed to take earlier. What could he be hiding? I had bad thoughts about his possible involvement right from day one, because shortly after she went missing, we formed a search party south of Brandon, close to his place where she was last seen. And you'd think that if he wanted to be involved in any way whatsoever, he would have been part of that search group, but he was not. After some analysis, authorities determined that Michael Bridges had some interesting body language during his interview with police, and he refers to Aaron in past tense. They need to take action quickly. On paper, everything that he said looked great, but when we looked at the video and put the audio and watched it in context of the nonverbal cues, the body language that he displayed, uh, we knew that he was concealing a lot more than what he was telling us. Care must be taken so Michael Bridges doesn't realize he's just become the prime suspect. He's put under surveillance to see if he'll lead police to any clues. He would stay hidden in the house for days or week at a time, not even associate with his few close friends. So we were becoming very frustrated with his lack of engagement overall, not just with us, but in life in general. That was a frustrating point in this investigation for sure. All the surveillance on Michael is proving he leads a boring life. It's time to get inside and see what they can find. We firmly believe that we had basically crossed all the T's, dotted all the I's in terms of being your standard investigational uh, techniques. They had really gotten us only to the point where we had to look at making another, another step.
When we conducted the search on the residence, there was a few things that, that came to note. In terms of forensic evidence, there, there was nothing. Keep in mind that Aaron actually, for all intents and purposes, lived on an in again, out again basis with the, with the Bridges family at their residence. In terms of finding, you know, articles of her clothing or hair or anything like that really was of no consequence. Our forensic investigation unit did uh, collect some forensic evidence. It turned out to be uh, false positives on, on some of the samples collected. Within his bedroom, uh, I found an envelope from his legal aid lawyer who was representing him on the assault charges against Aaron and her friend Lindsay. But on the back of that uh, letter from his legal aid lawyer, I found what I would refer to as crib notes, which outlined the basic story that he gave me uh, during my initial interview with him regarding him and Aaron's involvement the night that she was last seen by her family. While the list is suspicious, this search has turned up no evidence that Michael Bridges is responsible for Aaron's disappearance. And worse, their prime suspect now knows that he's on the police radar. It's been almost a year since Aaron Chorney's disappeared, and things are not looking good in the search for Aaron. However, the plot is about to thicken. When a mysterious letter is delivered to Debbie's home, indicating some intimate knowledge of Aaron's whereabouts, Debbie is taken aback. All of the letters alluded to the writer either being responsible for Aaron's disappearance or for having intimate knowledge of what actually happened. So aside from looking at the content of the letter, we also submitted the letters for forensic examination. While the letter is understandably nerve-wracking for the Chorneys, Sergeant Lockhart is hopeful that they'll make contact with the letter's writer. They went in for fingerprint examination. Uh, they tried lifting DNA off the stamps and off the uh, seal strips on the back of the envelope flap. And none of that w came to anything of fruition. So either the person who sent the letters was incredibly lucky or they were very organized and left no forensic evidence for us to find. From the analysis, they believe the letters have all been written by the same person and in the opposite hand. Our detectives one step closer to finding Aaron Chorney. After spending an enjoyable day with her mother and sister, Aaron Chorney heads out for coffee with a friend. Known for loving a good party, when Aaron doesn't come home the night of April 21st, 2002, no one thinks much of it. It's now been a year since anyone has seen or heard from Aaron. When cryptic letters begin appearing, police are hopeful they'll lead to some answers. But those hopes are dashed when the letters pose more questions than they answer. The community struggles with the fact that Aaron is still missing. But for Aaron's immediate family, it's unbearable. And then some cryptic letters that popped up somehow, and oh, there's, you know, there's more than one disturbed person doing this too. And it was very unsettling to read these and have them read to you. Police are desperate for clues. Their fears of going public have come true. They're inundated with numerous erroneous reports of possible Aaron sightings, but they're all for naught. They know the letters have to hold a clue, but their pleas for the writer to come forward, along with Darcy and Debbie's pleas for more information, have all gone in vain. The reality is, all the evidence they do have, circumstantial or not, points to one person. Out of options, out of clues, it's time to get creative. While police are having difficulty finding Aaron, their number one suspect gets a surprise visitor. It's a woman offering him an entry into a contest. An attractive smile is just what he could use after a year in the hot seat with police. And the chance to go to Calgary to watch a professional hockey game is just the thing to cheer him up. A few weeks later, Michael receives a phone call telling him he's won the contest. He can hardly believe his good luck. After the hockey game, Michael goes to a strip club where he meets another prize winner, Brock, and the two hit it off instantly. 
Michael's keen to maintain a friendship with him, and when he tells Brock he's from Brandon, Manitoba, Brock's elated, saying he's planning on moving to the area for some work, so the two exchange numbers. A few months have passed and Michael and Brock have struck up a friendship. Michael, lifelong in the western Manitoba area, arranges an apartment for Brock so he can be settled when he eventually moves there. And Michael can't put his finger on it. What exactly does Brock do for work? Whatever it is, it provides him with plenty of cash, and he's generous with it. Now that Brock is around more often, the two are meeting up regularly. They seem to be two peas in a pod. The one thing that Brock talks about, other than women, is honesty, honor, and loyalty. Brock and Michael arrive on a scheduled dirt road five minutes before the hour. While minutes early, Brock is already upset. The most important thing to him is that you fulfill your obligations. If you can't, then you're dishonest. And dishonesty is something he, nor his employers, take lightly. Michael can only stand by as he witnesses what happens to those who can't be honest. Michael is taken back by how strongly Brock feels about his so-called philosophy. He's even more surprised at how much money he can make to just deliver a few packages. Brock has another request, but only if Michael can promise to not look inside the bag. Maybe Michael already suspects, but what they're doing isn't exactly legal. Michael doesn't realize it, but he's about to pass his test. Can he make the drop without looking inside? There is this idea that someone transporting illegal goods, whether it be drugs or, or otherwise, if they don't know what they're carrying, they have this sort of plausible deniability, is the phrase that's often used, so that they would not appear untruthful if asked as to what they were carrying. Nervous, Michael can hardly keep it together. He doesn't want to disappoint Brock, and illegal or not, he knows that this is the best financial opportunity he's ever had. With a successful drop, Michael has shown he can at least get the job done. It's when Brock gets a troubling phone call that money is missing that proves he's all in to be a part of Brock's world. There's been some inconsistencies with some of the deliveries that Brock's men have been making. They all lead to this motel room. While Michael wants to help, Brock assures him he'll be fine. It's what happens next that's a true test of Michael's character. When Brock gets back to the car, he gives Michael a once-over. He wonders, can this be the guy? Can he do what it takes? Michael laughs, openly wondering why Brock just didn't kill the woman. Michael is ready. He's passed all the tests Brock can throw at him. It's time for the big ask. Brock asks Michael if he wants to join the criminal group that he's a part of, officially. But there's a catch. To get in, he must impress the boss with a tale of truly despicable nature and confess his biggest sin. The question is, does he have one to tell? Michael tells Brock that two years before he had gotten into an argument with his ex-girlfriend. He pushes her, but she trips and falls over an ottoman smashing her head on a table and dies. Not wanting to get in trouble, he hides her body. It sounds terrible, but Brock isn't sure that Michael's story is going to be enough to convince the big boss that Michael is a serious player. He accidentally kills his girlfriend. Doesn't really sound like a crime. It's also meaningless without a body, because Brock the Royal Canadian Mounted Police and the Brandon Police Services are going to need one to make the charges stick. Because this whole affair has been a ruse to get Michael to confess to his role in Aaron's disappearance.
vibrant Aaron Chorney of Brandon, Manitoba, has disappeared sometime on the evening of April 21st, 2002. Despite public pleas and an extensive search for Aaron, she's seemingly disappeared without a trace. The last person to see Aaron is her ex-boyfriend, Michael Bridges. He says she left his house that night, but something doesn't add up. Authorities orchestrate an elaborate sting operation in order to find out what Michael really knows. What we wanted to do was set up scenarios with very firm, very defined objectives to accomplish what we needed to accomplish. One of the primary things that we needed to enforce, and it was reinforced through just about every scenario, was the concept of trust and honesty within the organization. So to show that Mike was gaining the trust of the organization, he was giving a task where he had to transport the bag, which I believe he thought contained firearms, to a different destination, drop that bag off, pick up another bag or envelope and bring it back and turn it over. And again, that was to emphasize that trust and honesty aspect. The ultimate goal is to get Mike to want to join the organization, knowing that he has to be trustworthy, that he has to be honest, that basically the organization needs to know everything about him prior to actually taking him on and engaging him in the business of the organization. Through very frequent interaction, one of the attributes of being a good undercover operator is that you can morph into what is required. And Brock adjusted his portrayed out view of life to match Mike, so in terms of how they viewed and spoke about women. Going for frequent meals at restaurants where Brock was always picking up the tab. One of the scenarios that we created was where Brock and Mike arrived at a, at a hotel um, looking for a female who owed the organization some money. Undercover agents acted out a scenario where Brock assaults a woman, all to gauge how Michael would react. Mike liked money, he liked having disposable income, he didn't want to have to work too hard, and he liked being able to portray himself as kind of a uh, successful person without having to put the effort into it. Brock's organization promises to provide that. All it needs from Michael is honesty. There actually ended up being a total of three what I would term confessions from Mike, each being a little more detailed, a little more self-incriminating than the previous. He gave a very loose description as to what transpired, justifying everything that he did, basically portraying himself as a victim of the circumstances and having to uh, take the action that he did for self-preservation. Uh, when they got back to Brandon, and this was in February of 2004, uh, he did actually lead Brock to where he disposed of Aaron's body in the Brandon Cemetery. The following day, he gave a second, more detailed, more incriminating confession to Brock as they were sitting in a restaurant. Little do restaurant goers know that while they're enjoying a bite to eat, the confession to Western Manitoba's most notorious missing persons case is happening in their midst. Michael describes that he got into an argument with Aaron and choked her to death. With the assault charges that she had already laid against him, he knows that he had to cover it up by hiding Aaron's body in a shallow grave. We actually went in and did a surreptitious search of that grave to determine if Aaron's body was likely in there. Uh, that turned out to, in fact, be the case where we were able to say, yes, there is something in this grave that doesn't belong, and based on what our suspect has told us, we believe it to be Aaron's body. At that point in time, Brock led Mike to believe that he was ready to be introduced to Mr. Big to tell him all of his dark secrets 
uh, get that out in the open, let Mr. Big deal with it, and bring him in as a member of this organization. There are investigators who do become very proficient at conducting undercover operations where they can fully immerse themselves in a criminal underworld, so to speak. They may return to their normal life in the evening and then go back to living this so-called life of crime during the day, or they may be gone for months at a time. Investigators are about to find out that Michael's depravity goes even further than he describes. It's Michael Bridges' big night. Unaware that he's in the midst of a massive sting operation, his undercover RCMP handler, Brock, encourages him to go over the details one more time before meeting the boss. What Brock hears this time is even worse than he could have imagined. Brock actually has him go through the confession one more time as a rehearsal for what he's going to tell Mr. Big, and that was what was video and audio recorded at, at the hotel. Michael Bridges describes in detail how after he chokes Aaron with his hands, he uses an extension cord to finish her off. When the extension cord proves unsuccessful, he then fills the bathtub in order to drown her. Following Aaron's drowning, Michael Bridges then wraps her body in a blanket and buries her in a fresh grave in the Brandon Cemetery. As that was happening, that's when we were involved with recovering Aaron's remains from, from the cemetery. So those two events kind of happened simultaneously. Michael is stunned by the realization that he's just been the subject of a massive sting. That's where everything kind of came to fruition in terms of our investigative efforts. We never knew anything until the day that they arrested him. And that was in 2004, February 13th, I believe. Uh, I got a call from Sergeant Lockhart saying, you know, could you come down to the station? You know, we have some new information. But as much as we are happy that we were able to bring that investigation to a successful conclusion, the other aspect of it is that we took away all hope from the Chorney family of Aaron ever coming back to them. And uh, we went down and that's when we were told that she was found and they had, you know, recovered her body and and he was being arrested at the same time. The only question now is, can the authorities make the charges stick? Is the whole Mr. Big operation even admissible? So a Mr. Big sting is essentially where an undercover officer poses as a member of usually a criminal organization and tries to lure an accused person into a conspiracy. They gain their trust and they start talking about other things that they've done and try to get them to make admissions. So Mr. Big Stings have actually been banned in the UK and US. And they are admissible in court in Canada, but they're very controversial. And legal experts believe that they can potentially lead to coerced and false confessions. And it's essentially entrapment. But the RCMP know about the controversy surrounding this type of sting operation. Brock asks Michael on camera and on tape why he changed his initial story from it being just an accident. Michael states that he was nervous to tell him the whole story. His rehearsal statement to Brock, you know, as we're waiting for Mr. Big to arrive, uh, we believe to be the true story as to what happened that night, which was borne out as much as it could be by the forensic evidence that we recovered during the, during, uh, the recovery of Aaron's body. The courts agree. Michael Bridges is given a life sentence for a first-degree murder. You can't prepare yourself for a trial like that and have every detail read out to you. And it was, it was very difficult for the whole family. Still, some questions remain. To this day, we still don't know who sent the letters. 
The Chorneys are left with an errand sized hole in their lives. The town is shocked, but will move on together with an invigorated notion to watch out for each other and tackle partner abuse. There was hundreds and hundreds of people at Aaron's funeral. I am sure thousands, which we knew that everybody was looking for her. And it was evident at that funeral to have an opportunity to say goodbye because we never could say goodbye. I'm just really happy how the community came together, our friends and our family. So traumatic for all of us to have to deal with the emotions. And I don't want anybody else to have to go through this again. As if to add insult to injury, in April of 2021, a judge says Michael can apply for early parole under a now defunct faint hope clause in 2026 instead of 2029, a process that forces the family to relive Aaron's murder all over again. He's supposed to be in there until 2029, and that's still not long enough as far as we're concerned. It's like the, the feeling like there's enough things that could make up for, like you can't just be a better person and say it's okay, because it's not. It's not okay. Erin's not just a tragedy, that she is like the best sister. <laughs> she is the most amazing daughter. She is the best friend for me. Like that's important that her memory is made known that she is still so loved, still so missed.